everyone and welcome to this Heritage Volunteering Group Coffee Afternoon. Um, it's March the 8th, which only means one thing. It is International Women's Day. So for today, we are going to be focused on uh, gender and what that means um, to any of us and all of us. And we're going to hear from a couple of people about their own experiences about gender in the workplace. And for today, we're going to focus mainly on the workplace and professional development. But obviously, you may have your own personal uh, insights to share as well. So and um, we're going to start off with our two speakers and then we will move to an open discussion and um, some questions so please keep your questions in your mind pop them in the chat as they occur to you and we will um, run a panel discussion uh, once we've heard from Tamsin and Catherine and so that I don't mistake you guys I'm going to let you introduce yourselves and we will go from there but a huge thank you to you both for, for joining us today we're delighted to have you. Tamsin over to you. Uh, fantastic. Thank you very much. Really delighted to be here. Um, I'm here with a variety of hats on, I suppose, and I would say that's probably one of my abiding thoughts about gender in the workplace, and I'll come along to that in, in, more, in more detail. But yeah, I'm Tamsin Russell. I work for the Museums Association, leading on workforce. But to my absolute joy, I'm part of the amazing HVG group and lead on the EDI or inclusion working group. So I'm here primarily to talk about my experience as a woman, and I'll explain that very shortly, uh, and also in terms of my role of HVG. I'm not here talking specific about any of my work associated with the Museums Association. And the only other thing you need to know as part of today's talk is I'm always really candid because I find being honest and transparent enables everyone to grow as long as we do that with respect. So I'll be sharing certainly some very personal insights in terms of my experience in the sector. Thank you. Thank you. Catherine, do you want to introduce yourself and we'll go back to Tamsin? Of course, yeah. Hello. Uh, my name is uh, Catherine McAlpine. Uh, I am the director of the Brunel Museum. Uh, I've been in that post uh, for just over a year. Uh, so I'll talk, um, I'll be talking a bit, I suppose, about my career path, um, being uh, director of a small museum, what that kind of means. Uh, and something that I might uh, touch on um, is, is thinking about sort of gender in the workplace and kind of um, uh, different kind of sectors. Uh, so heritage, um, I've also got a background in science communication and thinking about sort of uh, um, trying to get more girls into STEM and actually sort of uh, what do we mean and maybe unpacking some of those ideas. I think there's there's, there's a kind of interesting uh, conversation to be had there. Uh, so I'm kind of looking to you guys for some insights. Uh, but yes, that's um, far too long for an introduction. I'll hand back over to Tamsin. Wonderful. I'm excited already, ladies. Thank you very much. Tamsin. So um, thank you. And so one of the first things that I'm going to highlight is so often we as women, and I use that term broadly, so that's a really important thing for me to highlight, that is when I talk about women, I mean all women. So I'm an, an inclusive feminist. So often we find that women choose not to or apologise for occupying their space. And I am that one person, as Catherine just said, oh, I think I've probably talked too long. Uh, absolutely not. You have this platform, you've been given this platform and you can continue to occupy that space in terms of that platform. I sometimes, when I'm at conferences, just look to see how many people do overspeak their time slot, and women very rarely do. So they don't steal time from other speakers. They do tend to occupy their, their space, uh, which is great to those limits, but certainly I think we need to to think about that. So I'm um, delighted to be here. Um, the first time I heard about International Women's Day, I was traveling in Australia and it was was on the 7th of March, I think 1995. Um, and I came across a celebration of women. One tote bag later and 27 years on, I am ever thankful to all the women that have put the wheels in motion specifically to enable me to travel across the globe, age 21, to be uh, able to visit and be a solo traveler. So always, always grateful. Um, 
I am going to be talking about my experience as a white working class woman. Uh, I'm a cis, I'm heterosexual, I'm atheist, and I have no underlying health conditions or disabilities. Now, the reason I have listed all those things out is I do also think it's really important to understand that my experience is exactly that, my experience. And what we do know from a raft of research is that if I did have any other of differences, if I did have an underlying disability, if I did have a different ethnicity, my experience of work as a woman would be different and it's most likely to be different in a negative context so that's another really important thing i think to to, to hold on to uh, is when you're listening to to people certainly catherine and myself <laughs> um uh, about what our experience is that's that's our experience and not everybody else's so what do we know so we know that 51 percent of the population are women Yet we know that only 23% of them are in the workplace. Now, obviously, there are going to be people that are too old to work and people that are too young to work and people that, for whatever reason, can't work. But so even though we are still a majority within the, the demographic, in terms of our participation in the workforce, it's lower. And also, when we look at that participation in the workforce, you're more likely to see women undertake part-time roles. So in terms of um, part-time work, 38% of women are likely to be working in a part-time basis as opposed to men, where it's only 13%. We also know that there is sector segregation. So what does that mean? That means that we're more likely to see women working in health and social care. We're more likely to see women working in retail or in education. And interestingly enough, are all of those areas of work really well paid? perhaps less so. So the occupational segregation in terms of field and often role exists, and that then does have an impact potentially on uh, unequal pay. So what we also know from recent studies is on average, if you're a woman in this audience and you're sitting virtually next to a man in this audience, if you were doing a job of equal value and equal worth, you would still be earning 15% less than they are. I know this is not a really good news story, is it? But, you know, we have to say these things and we have to measure these things to enable us to know where the barriers are and what the reality is so we can then put in an improvement plan to change them. We also know, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, as part of that occupational segregation, uh, women tend to be in the lowest paid jobs in their entirety. And that isn't just a function of part-time work, it is a function of this occupational segregation or sector segregation. We also know that 58% of women have said they haven't been able to apply for a job or apply for a promotion that would get them maybe more money um, because of additional caring responsibilities. And I, again, I want to make sure that everyone's really clear. I, I find it some I find it I find it difficult when we talk about women in the workplace. There's often a conflation about reproductive behavior, you know, so everything that's coming along, the reason why you can't do this or reason, is all because you've chosen to have a family. And I think that that's a very different that's, that, that's here, but that's not about the majority of people's experience of work. What do we know about our sector? So unfortunately, more research is needed. So there is limited research into the different diversity characteristics in terms of the workforce. So Arts Council England have done in the past some really good work, certainly their creative case for diversity measured for their major organisations, what the makeup was. And the most recent one, um, uh, and this is still a couple of years ago, said that 62% of the workforce in the heritage sector were women, okay? So hold that, 62%. We do know that organisations report on equal pay. However, because equal pay reporting only requires organisations of a certain size to report on equal pay, we don't have a really clear picture about what that looks like. So for example, Catherine in the smaller organisations, you know, we, we might not get that. Um, and what we've certainly seen, even in my own organisation, is that, that COVID has gotten in the way. And again, if you Google COVID and the concept of equal pay, is lots of organisations haven't been able to do the analysis because they have been focused on, on other things. We know from the Museums Association's research into bullying, sticks and stones research, is that you are more likely to feel that your gender was a function of why you were targeted. 
and that increased if you were a young woman not hugely but it still increased if you were a young woman also increased if you were a young woman with a disability i'd love to comment on um young women working class women with a disability also through a through a sort of an, an ethnicity lens but our response rate in terms of our diversity profile was really really small so i can't make any of those 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 uh sort of uh thoughts basically more research is needed all of that leads me to think that existing structures procedures and policies all of those hangovers of a predominantly male dominated workforce still exist and are still normalized and institutionalized so that when somebody makes a suggestion around changing working hours or core hours they are often met with well we've always done it like this or how would that work but what about these people so lots of uh, sort of nostalgic senses or also what about her is rather than actually saying actually let's just try it let's just move it forward so that's I suppose my, my starting point what does my experience of work mean as a woman so I've got a few bullet points uh, written down so one of the things I have I suppose been exposed to and back to that 62 percent so I've heard women and men say that the sector is overly feminized so there's, there's too many women in the sector. And actually what we need to do is we need to get more men in the sector. Now, absolutely, 62 versus, do the maths, 38, I think, um, uh, might well be a call to look at rebalancing. But if we look at occupational segregation, if we look at the roles that women tend to occupy, they don't tend to be either in leadership roles or higher up in the, the hierarchy. They tend to be segregated in, in, in roles that have a very clear and defined remit. So I'm not sure what we mean by feminization of the, the heritage sector. Um, I think my experience also has been that beware a feminist in wolf's clothing um, so what do I mean by that? And I'm planning to do a, a, a Twitter line about it later on today, is that lots of women say they're feminists, but judge them on their actions rather than their words is what I would say. So don't be fooled. Um, things that I often see happen is that women occupy either extra role behaviours or co-worker behaviours that pigeonhole them. So what does that mean? It means that often women are the first people to put their hands up when somebody says, can somebody uh, be on a committee? Or if your organisation is saying, we're going to look for champions. Can you be a green champion, a communications champion, an equality champion? Again, often what we find is that women put their hands up. I'm not saying any of this is bad, but there is a consequence to that. So if you're putting your hands up to do all of these extra role activities, what you have to remind yourself of is your finite amount of time. And what does that mean in terms of spreading yourself so thinly that those really important, those conversations that are meant to be having either as a function of your role or as a function of the discipline you work in, are you adequately rested and have adequate thinking time and participation time to also do that? Or are you spread too thinly because of all of these extra role behaviours because you've put your hand up? They can be hugely rewarding. They can be hugely developmental. I'm not saying don't do them, but go in when you're putting your hand up for extra role activities with your eyes wide open about what that might mean. What might be the negative consequences as well as the positive consequences? I think there's also some other sort of co-worker behaviour, which potentially now we're not as much working together in an office might well um, perpetuate. So I am often and have been in the past, no longer, the person that says, I will take notes. I'm the person that says, shall I get everybody a cup of tea? Because I'm wanting to make sure that everyone feels comfortable and everyone is in a place where they can be most productive. What that means is I'm outside boiling the kettle when other conversations are happening in that main space. What that means is that I'm paying attention, writing notes 
without necessarily being able to formulate my ideas, without necessarily being able to say, oh, what about this? So again, extra activities, co-worker behaviours, you know, the person that's always organising the, the leaving party or the collection. Look around your organisations, people. I see who are doing these extra role activities. So just that's just mindful for that. Um, I think there often is uh, a sense of modesty, probably a nice way of putting it. I've put self-deprecation and self-reduction on my list about saying, oh, only, or have I spoken too long? Or uh, I think you've probably heard enough about me. So sometimes depending on who we are, we might then choose to diminish our voice as a function of saying only or just, or maybe another thing, have you thought about? So tentative language potentially rather than assertive and owning language. I've got different hats and I've already talked about extra role and coworker, but I also think it is important to think about the extra roles that people have outside of work. Um, and that could be caring for an older relative or a partner or, or, or children. It's all of those things. Um, but there is certainly still a sense of presenteeism that's required. And uh, often people say, oh, I'm only part time. No such thing. Do you know what? As a part time worker, you could probably do more work in the time you have than you've got a full time worker because they'll be doing other things. So this, this whole idea about diminishing ourselves when we've got either extra roles as a function of caring responsibilities, I think is important. Um, certainly when I went on maternity leave, my other co-workers in my office uh, were not hugely nice about me going on maternity leave. My choice, I get it. Not everyone wants to or doesn't need to, but it doesn't mean primarily at this day and age, the people that are going to be going on maternity leave are going to be winning women pretty much. So what does that that mean in terms of how people treat you and also what does that then mean about your need to go back so for both of my maternity leaves I was back in the office for a return to work day after six weeks complete and utter nonsense because what I felt I had to do very clearly is that the fact that I was now a mother hadn't changed anything about me I was still there I was still on time I was still committed and please judge me on who I am as a professional rather than who I am outside of this. Now, I think we all have to bring a whole work, whole person to work. Um, and it just, I, I think my reflection around that was that actually no one's gonna remember that. I'm now four organizations along. No one remembers all of that really significant effort, four organizations behind, because everyone's moved on. So there's something also about thinking about the long game around all of this. I'm gonna draw that to a close uh, and just summarize. So one, think about challenging outdated modes and ways of thinking and unevidenced uh, statements are like, I think the sector's overly feminized. Beware of feminists in, in wolf's clothing. Think about where you invest your time and effort in terms of extra role and coworker behaviors. Please don't undermine yourself. There are plenty of other people waiting in the wings wanting to do exactly that. And absolutely think about what your other life and career choices are and how they relate. I had a conversation with somebody this morning when we were talking about bringing our whole selves to work and they reflected, but work isn't my whole self. So just think about those other domains and what those pushes and pulls are. I'm going to stop talking and hand back to Rhiannon. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tamsin. So much food for thought there, I think, for everyone um, and lots of questions for us to delve into a bit later. Don't forget to post your questions or uh, discussion points in Pigeonhole. I've included a link in the chat. It just means that we can get to the most important and relevant points for the majority of the audience rather than sticking to the ones we fancy doing. So I'm going to hand over now to um, Catherine um, and she is going to talk about her experience. Thank you ever so much Catherine. Amazing, thank you. Um, 
comes in. That was that was brilliant. I I loved that. I I don't know if you could see me, uh, but I was nodding through quite a lot of that, um, and it it gave me quite a lot to think about in the kind of um, the talk that I'm about to give. So I think what I'll do is I'll sort of start a little bit uh, by talking about me and my um, uh, my background. Um, and I very hastily, while I was listening. Um, uh, to Tamsin, I put some slides together, but to be honest, they're not they're not really um, that much more compelling. But I can I can pop them out. Um, I kind of realised that that one of the defining features of my career has been sitting in a room and asking the question, "Where are the women?" Um, and that has kind of been a defining characteristic of of my museum career to date. So I'm going to just give a couple of examples um, of that. So. Um, when uh, I worked at the National Maritime Museum, um, a lot of what I was doing was about sort of uh, bringing out those uh, stories of women from the collection, uh, so they were included in our um, in, in our kind of interpretation. So one of the um, uh, and I was an event programmer, and, and one of the things uh, that used to really kind of drive me up the wall was people saying you'd be talking about an exhibition, and people would go. Um, uh, well, where are the women? Where are the women in this exhibition? Um, and you go, oh, uh, well, you know, you you could you could do an events program for that, couldn't you? You don't you don't we don't need to actually put them in the gallery. They don't actually need to be there permanently, do they? We can just we you know we can just do a you know eighth of March International Women's Day event and then job done, box ticks. Uh, we've we've done the women. They're done. Um, so that used to really kind of frustrate me which was one of the reasons that I moved into uh, exhibition interpretation that's why I, I wanted to be able to sort of tell those those stories and make sure that they were kind of on the wall um so uh and, and one of the things that I'm you know I'm genuinely really proud of I worked on a Tudor and Stuart Seafarers gallery at the National Maritime Museum and I spent two years literally sitting in a room going but where are the women but where are the women um and that can be a really tricky thing um, in, in museums when we're kind of thinking about our collections and the stories that we want to tell, um, because sometimes they're not there because of the way that our society has been structured and the, the society that we live in. People haven't, previous, you know, curators, directors, collectors haven't considered women to be important enough um, a, 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 along with other a, lots of other kind of identities and, and, and groups um, but they haven't been considered important enough to collect um, and I've really kind of seen it as, as, as my role to not do that collecting not necessarily um, do that research but to push my colleagues to ask that question um, so so that's kind of one of the things that I was sort of reflecting on uh, while, while Tamsin was talking uh, so when I was at the, the Maritime Museum uh, if you ever go to the Tudor and Stuart Seafarers Gallery, which was the one I worked on, um, there was a whole section uh, on the Anglo-Dutch Wars, um, and it was really important um, for me that in this section that was that was talking about war and the kind of naval capacity of war, and it was kind of paintings of uh, of, of naval warships, um, that actually we we told a broader story. Um, and the story that we told was about uh, war widows, so women, uh, wives who'd been widowed as a result of, um, of the conflict in the Anglo-Dutch Wars. Uh, they'd written letters, I worked with a researcher, and they'd written these petitions to, um, to the, the Admiralty asking for uh, more funds. Um, they, they were basically saying that my widow's pension is not enough, my husband has been lost at sea, my husband has been... Um, uh, left and we need um, we, we need more funds. I need more funds to be able to support my family. And it was really important for me that this um, this story was told because it was a story of female agency four hundred years ago, um, and it helped change the narrative. Um, it, it's a story of women petitioning people in power and and kind of asking. Um, and, 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 and in many cases kind of getting what they needed. Um, so I, I felt that that was a really kind of important way of us uh, kind of changing the narrative. Um, but there are also lots of um, kind of issues around that that we, that we do kind of have to think about in terms of uh, 
we have to think about kind of who has who has had power um, throughout history. And uh, one of the things that I kind of want want to reflect on, and I'd be really interested in your kind of views in the discussion, is by pulling out these stories of women when they're, they're, there are so, you know, there may be so few in your collection that you end up just talking about the one, um, you end up exceptionalizing that individual as well. And that's a really, uh, that's a really sort of tricky uh, situation to be in. Um, so uh, to kind of bring that up to date, um, I'm now the director of, of the Brunel Museum. Uh, we're an incredibly small team. So everything that Tamsin was saying about, uh, you know, part time work, that's, you know, that absolutely kind of sums us up. Uh, a lot of our staff have uh, other roles or caring responsibilities, uh, which makes part time work really sort of attractive for them. Um, but I'm, I'm very kind of conscious of all of these things sort of going on in the background uh, when I'm when I'm recruiting staff. Um, but we are the story of the we are the on the site of the Thames Tunnel uh, and we tell the story of the Brunels uh, and the Brunels in this case is very often it's Mark Brunel and his son Isambard Kingdom Brunel. It's a big macho masculine engineering story. Uh, and in 2018, uh, we did a visitor survey and 88% of our visitors were male. Um, so you might find that, um, you know, while, while your workforce may be uh, overly feminized or whatever the phrase that, that Tamsin was, um, that, that your audience, um, your audience uh, may not, you know, may not be and, and can in fact skew one way rather than the other. Um, and for me, it's been really important to kind of tell a much broader story of the Brunels and the Thames Tunnel in the time that I've been there. Um, so while uh, we obviously do talk about Mark and um, Isambard Brunel's engineering, one of the stories that we've we've kind of that we tell quite often is the story of Sophia Brunel, Isambard's sister. Um, now, Isambard's sister, she was once apparently described uh, as Isambard in, uh, Brunel in petticoats. Uh, so she was kind of seen as this, um, that she had all of the skills, she had the sort of technical ability um, to have been an engineer, um, but because of the society she lived in at that time, uh, she, she wasn't able to, to, to fulfil that. She went on and she, um, she became a kind of quite celebrated ceramics painter in her lifetime. Uh, so she did, you know, achieve, but not in the same way that her brother did. And no one has heard of Sophia Brunel, the ceramicist, in the way that people have heard of Isambard Kingdom Brunel. So she's a really important part of our schools programme and our family programme. And, and it's really important that, that we, we tell that story more broadly. Um, but I think there's within that, there's kind of questions around um, just because she was kind of described as Brunel in petticoats and being sort of you know, this incredible mind, um, thinking about how, um, how she might have been sort of held back by stereotypes in her own time, but also that she herself experienced many privileges that weren't available to lots of other people at that time. Um, so that's quite a lot to pack into a school session and a, a family session, but those are the sorts of things that I'm thinking about when we're sort of putting together our programmes is kind of by talking, focusing in on one individual, how, how do you use that to talk about more broad experiences? And I, I just kind of wanted to echo Tamsin's point about sort of, you know, my experience is, is my experience. And, and quite often we do make leaps in museums to kind of tell bigger, bigger narratives using an individual. And actually, um, I think we can use that as a way to, get people to reflect and to think, but I think we have to be very careful about the sort of um, broader stories that we're telling. Um, so yeah, those are sort of some of the, the things that I um, uh, was kind of reflecting on and kind of the way that we tell stories um, and what sort of stories we choose, not just what sort of stories that we choose to tell that sort of just putting women out there um, actually, are we reinforcing this kind of exceptional, this idea of exceptional women? Um, and actually, we ignore some of the structural things that, that 
explain why there are so few women in our collections or in our stories or that aren't being talked about. Um, uh, before I close, one person that I, I would recommend you uh, look out if you can. Uh, I had the privilege of working with a woman called Alice Rowe, who ran a thing called Her Story a couple of years ago. Um, and one of the, the brilliant kind of tips she had was, uh, you know, don't be afraid, you know, don't feel that you have to hit the gold standard. You don't have to have a name, a birth date. Um, you, can, you can tell these broader stories in a different way. And don't be afraid to look at collectives, because particularly when you start looking at sort of working class histories, actually that's, a, that's really a community history of kind of people coming together. Um, so you might not have an individual in the way we have the Brunels or Sophia Brunel. Um, you might have a, a group of people who came together to do things and, and, and don't be afraid of that, that you can tell those stories too. Um, so that's a sort of some musings on uh, sort of women and power and interpretation and, and collections. Uh, so, you know, just, just small things for a Tuesday afternoon. Um, and I'll hand back over to Rhiannon. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Catherine. And I hadn't thought about many of the angles that you've brought in. And actually, um, that idea of, of putting the exceptional women on, on the stage and, and ignoring the rest, I feel like I did that with the invite even for today by bigging you and Tamsin up. So, um, yeah, here's to all us normal people as well. Um,